First one is, is that there is no youth tonight uh, because of the Super Bowl party, but Sean will give you uh, a announcement later when he comes up. Uh, we also have uh, Monday night at 7 p.m. we have a finance committee meeting. On Tuesday at 10 a.m. we have Women Inspired by God. Um, on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. we have prayer and Bible study meeting and we also have Discovery Club. Uh, they're both happening at the same time. And then Friday at 6 p.m. we have the Woven Women uh, movie night. And uh, there's a little blurb in your uh, bulletin and I'll read it for you. Uh, there's a movie night, Friday, February 17th at 6 p.m. Come and join us for a relaxing night of being together to watch the movie Overcomer and to eat popcorn and assorted snacks. And they said, feel free to wear your pajamas, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Uh, so just come out and have a great time with the other women in our church. Uh, we'd love to be a part of that. Um, I can't because I'm not a woman. But... Uh, but Hey, you can still watch the movie. So, um, I think that's all the announcements we have for this week. Um, if not, you can check out our bulletin boards. They always have new information coming out uh, to keep you involved in what's going on in our church. Uh, so let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and this time that we get to come together as a body of Christ and worship you together as one. We just pray that you would come into this place and fill this place with your spirit. Let it be known of who you are and help us to glorify you in our worship and also in the word. And we pray that you would be with us the rest of this day and the rest of this week and for all eternity. We thank you and we praise you for all that you do. In your name we pray. Amen. As Pastor Cam was saying, the announcement this morning is that we have a super fellowship party coming this evening, starting at 6 o'clock. So the game will start at 6.30. We hope everybody comes, bring a snack to share, uh, enjoy the, the football game or the other games that we're going to be uh, setting up. There will be games for the kids. There will be uh, football to watch. There will be all kinds of different things we can do. So we hope that everybody can... Join us, come for part of it, come for all of it, whatever you want to do. The children can be dismissed for Sunday school. And let us stand as we begin our, our praise this morning. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has a great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has the great things. He has the great. Yeah. 
hold your life upon him this morning. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
Jesus, beautiful Savior, God of all majesty, risen King, Lamb of God, holy and righteous, blessed Redeemer, bright morning star. your name, name above every name, Jesus. Jesus, beautiful
just want to thank God for who he is and how beautiful a Savior Jesus truly is. Uh, if there are any prayer requests, um, I, I don't think we have a microphone down there, do we? If we have any prayer requests, uh, Pastor Josiah, uh, walk around. Are you going to preach the sermon first? No. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but I can. In an instant. I've been getting um, posts that um, Asbury um, campuses are under a great revival. They are in, I think, a week of revival now, and it's spreading to the other campuses around them. I just want to praise God for the answers to prayer for my sister, Barbara. She is making strides. The motivation's there to keep walking and trying, and um, I just want to praise him. She'll be home probably in a couple weeks, back Amazing. to her home, wow. the house she lives in. So. Amazing. I'd like to praise the Lord. My brother, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. My brother told me last night his wife is in the Philippines. She is a Filipino. And them two together, my brother Russ and Co sister-in-law Cora, are building a church in the Philippines. So spread the word. Amen. Um, I had a recent update on my sister who's been diagnosed with the ALS. She's not doing well. She's basically forcing herself to eat so she doesn't lose more weight. Um, and she's really struggling with fear. Even though she's a believer, she's, she's very fearful of the future. Uh, just an update on uh, Roger Tatura. Yeah, he did come home from the hospital. He'd been in the hospital for 17 days. Uh, but unfortunately, they were unable to stop the internal bleeding, but they have some other <coughs> possibilities that they're going to use to address that. So just keep Roger in your prayer. And of course, the, the Zindel family, let's keep them in your prayer at Eddie's passing. Any other prayer requests? I'd just like to pray for the church and the church family. Any others? If not, let's hope. Oh. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to praise God for uh, the way he provides for us and allows us to um, continue to build our, our church up here and just um, how good worship sounded this morning. There was a lot of hard work that went into things this week and getting the sound system going and things. And for me as a musician, I've always connected very spiritually with God through any sort of music. And man, was it just beautiful to hear how clear it is this morning. So Thank you, God, that we're able to do things like that. Sure. I just want to praise God for the power and in prayer and the answers to prayer. And one announcement that I forgot to have made this morning was that it's beginning this coming Wednesday morning. Um, Woven has been such a blessing to me, and anyone who's interested can join with me at 8.30 Wednesday morning. I know Eva is interested. And we're just going to come and pray around the altar. There's no planned program, just a time of prayer. So I thank you for women. I thank you for woven. I thank you for answered prayer. And just ask it if you would like to join us, please come. Come when you can. Leave when you have to. But it's just going to be a time of praying. And this hopefully will be an ongoing um, weekly event. Thank you. 
Any other prayer requests? I want to thank you for praying for a little love. Uh, Abby. She lives in Morrisville, and she's a, she was a student of my great grand, my grandchildren. And uh, she had a heart attack while she was in school or when she went home, and they couldn't save her. And uh, But would you still pray for her family? I don't know the family. I don't know whether she's got siblings or not, but I know they're going to need prayer. Definitely pray. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, first we want to thank you for who you are and how you have blessed not only this church, but this world with your love and your goodness. Lord, there's a lot of hurt in this world, but Lord, you, you have come to redeem it and to set it free. Lord, you sent your son to save each and every person on this earth. We thank you for your power and your goodness and your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for what is happening at Asbury with their revival. Lord, we thank you that your spirit is moving and your spirit is ever present in that not only just in that chapel, but in that school, but us. It's spreading, Lord. It's spreading like wildfire. We thank you for that. We thank you for how you are showing up in people's lives. Lord, we want to praise you for the church in Philippines and how you're going to work through that in ways that we could not even ever begin to imagine. Lord, how you are going to work in that country and how you are going to work just in that church alone, we can't even fathom, we, Lord. We pray that you would be present in that moment and that when they look for you, it's not hard to find you. Lord, we also want to pray for our church and our church family and how we need your provision and your guidance every single day. Lord, we need your love and we need your hope. We also need your goodness and your kindness. We pray that we would be pursuing to be Christ-like, to be exactly like you. Help us to have that pursuit, not just personally, but as an entire church. Lord, as we talk about your goodness and faithfulness, we need it a lot with some of these prayer requests that we have. Lord, for Claire's sister, Lord, help her in her fear to know who is in control. Help her to feel a sense of peace even when there seems to be no peace. Help her to see exactly who you are. Help her to feel your presence in every moment and feel that peace that comes with it. Lord, we pray for the Tutora family. We thank you that Roger came home. We are praying for him still because he's still bleeding. We don't know what the solution is, but Lord, we know what your solution is, and it is your intervention. No matter what that looks like, Lord, be with him. Be with the family. Lord, we also think of the Zindel family today. We pray that you would show your love and mercy and kindness to the Zindel family as they've, as they've lost a part of their family, but they know that heaven has gained someone. We thank you for that. We also pray for Abby who had a heart attack. We pray for that family. We pray for that whole situation. Lord, we pray for 
you to show up in a way that we could not even imagine. Lord, we thank you for the power of prayer and how we know that when we come to you with prayer requests, we know they aren't empty requests. We know that when we come, we, we show up and we pray that you are going to listen to each and every word that we say with the intent of working. Lord, we thank you that you are true and you are sovereign and that you are over all. Lord, we also pray for Barbara. We pray that you would be with her. We pray that you'd be with everyone surrounding her. Show her your love and grace. Show her your comfort. So Lord, as we move into this time of diving into your word, would it be not only just a benefit to us, but a benefit to the kingdom. Help us to listen to your word and hear your word and hear what Pastor Josiah has to say. Help him to bring your word to life. Help him to say what you want to be said today. Help us to learn how to be givers. How to be more giving of ourselves, even when we feel we cannot give anymore. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all that you do. It's your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Cam. Well, this morning, we're finishing our I Am a Giver series, or this Being a Giver series. And this morning, the, we've been looking at this question of what does it mean to be a giver? And what does this mean according to Scripture? We're really looking at the Scriptures to say, how do we live a life that is giving? And... and uh, I shared last week, but I'll share again this Sunday. Uh, next week, we're going to be starting a uh, week early, kind of our, our Lenten series, but it's, it's a series called Out of Darkness. We're looking at the book of Exodus and looking at our lives in the book of Exodus and how we connect with the book of Exodus and how Exodus directs us towards Jesus and directs us towards the cross. And this series that we're going to be preaching next week. It's going to finish up on, on Good Friday, so the, the series will end on Good Friday with the last message then uh, that looks at the Passover and, and really what was Jesus going through that night in, in that moment. And so uh, really looking forward to that. But today we're looking at being a giver, looking at the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. Now if you've never read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's one of the most interesting books of the Bible. This, as we examine this passage, we're looking at how being a giver really has a time limit. It has a time limit. And this aspect of time influences the way that we give, the way that we understand giving. And so this morning we're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and we're looking at verses 1 through 14. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet, no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. 
This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear Him. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we consider Your Word, as we consider the book of Ecclesiastes and this thought of of being a giver and the way that You direct us, that You lead us through the different seasons of our life, Lord, I pray that you would speak boldly through your word this morning. May we see how you are at work. Well, we know Ecclesiastes is a, is a book that challenges us to look at the brevity of life. But Lord, let's, as we consider the brevity of life, we have to consider what do we give ourselves to? What do we refrain from? Lord, I I pray this morning, would you speak to us? Would you open our eyes that we may see wonderful things in your law? Lord, will we see your hand in our midst? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes is one of these books that was written by Israel's third ruler, King Solomon, the son of King David. Now, Solomon is well known for the wisdom that he had and that he shared with others. This wisdom is carried in in three notable books in the Bible, the book of Proverbs, the Song of Songs, and this book, the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes means one who sits or teaches in the assembly of the local people. And It sounds like a very interesting book, but the entire book is about life and the meaningless things we do. I mean, this is the encouraging book you'd want to read. You go into Barnes & Noble, you you go to the inspirational section, you'd see Ecclesiastes, right? That's that's what you'd imagine. Yeah, yeah. life is meaningless. You know, that's not what we want to hear in the inspirational section. Uh, The words of this book, though, are often... Can, can be seen as disheartening it, it, because the m- word meaningless is actually used around 38 times in this book. And Ecclesiastes seems like the cynical and, and kind of despairing book. However, chapter 3 stands out as an important part of it because it recognizes an important part of being human. It's a part that we often ignore each day, that we don't think about. We keep it as far back in our mind as possible. It's the fact that death is a part of life. That there are polarities we move through from birth until death. And these polarities are revealed in this poetic way that Solomon describes our lives. These are, are, there's so many different seasons to the life we are given by God that He gives to us. Yet Solomon's cynical response to what he sees as the brevity and meaningless aspects of life almost sounds like this hedonism or this self-interested love. But we got to be careful of this because that's not what, what Scripture is saying. We could read Ecclesiastes and say, well, if everything is meaningless, then I should follow verses 12 and 13 and just say, well, I should just drink and be happy, you know, forget everything else, so self-interested love. But if all we take from Ecclesiastes is this self-interested love, then we miss the bigger picture Solomon is sharing and the entire scriptures are sharing. Solomon is sharing the polarity between God and man about how life is meaningless without submitting our life to God's divine will and commandments. Turn with me to the end of Ecclesiastes. This is chapter 12, verses 13 through 14. This is where Solomon summarizes much of what he's written. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 through 14 says this. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. This is the conclusion and, and the way that we see that the seasons in chapter 3 are then revealing something to us about the life of our Christian walk today. 
that there is brevity in our life, but there is purpose in it. And a Christian today who wants to be a giver, we have to recognize the brevity of man's life points to the internal importance of our giving of ourselves to God's purposes today, daily, every step of the way. Which leads us to our first point this morning, that giving has a timely discernibility. Things that we should give our time to, or things that we should not ever give up. There is discerning aspects of our time that we should be considering. What do we give ourselves to? What do we give up? And the nature of life is that we have limited time. We have limited energy. We have limited resources. You know, there's only a certain times in your life you can really go to school. There's only a certain times in your life you can have a certain career. Time to have children. Time to have grandchildren. Time to start businesses or new hobbies. All these sorts of times we have to discern in our lives. Do we give ourselves to it or do we need to give something up? But Scripture is clear. There's a lot of things that we should never give up when we consider the Christian life, when we're being a giver of ourselves, We should never give up these aspects. And the first of those is gathering together with other Christians. This aspect that's mentioned in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. We're never supposed to be giving up gathering. We're never supposed to be giving to the kingdom alone. If you're living your Christian faith and saying, I got a relationship with Jesus, I I don't really need other people, (laughs) I think you're missing out on a key part of the Christian life. You're giving up something that is vital to your ability to discern your ability to know what you are to give your life over to. You see, you were placed in a specific location, in a specific time, so that God could use you where you are, to give yourself over to the body of Christ, to give yourself to His purposes. When we give up church for a screen, or the next inspirational message on the radio, what we give up is an important part of our faith. The power of being spurred on and spurring others on in the faith. What happens without other believers spurring us on is our faith begins to dwindle. We stop doing good deeds. We don't meet together, so we don't have the timely discernment to know what to do next with a Christian community to help us. We don't have a Christian community to tell us whether the way we're living is righteous or whether we need to be held accountable. We need community. We need to gather together with other Christians. Another aspect of something that we should never give up is unity in the body. Ephesians 4.3 says that we should make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. If, if peace is not directing our efforts as the body, then we're, we're seeking to destroy and devour each other, as we talked about the other week. Peace, it gives timely discernment to know what would bring peace to the church or what would be bringing destruction and brokenness. Like the false teachers who were teaching that the resurrection already happened in 2 Timothy, and last week we talked about. In Timothy's church, they were leading the church away from Christ that day. Not later, when the resurrection really will happen, they were leading them away now. They needed correction, and peace needed to be restored, to reign in that church. We should never give up the unity in the church. Another thing that we should never give up is the scriptures. Hebrews 4.12. If you'll turn there with me, this is, this is a big one. Hebrews 4.12. says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We can never give up the Scriptures because they are living. They are a living part of our faith. You know, 
We know how to discern what to give ourselves through timely scriptures, through daily word with God. But we can only experience this if we have read them that day. Have you ever thought about what scriptures you missed today because you weren't in tune with what God was speaking? Ever, ever wondered that? Maybe he had a specific passage for you that day, but you didn't open to it. You missed it. You were supposed to read this to help free you from the anxiety you're facing, the depression, the right path to go and the wrong path to avoid. But because you hadn't opened the word that day, you missed it. I had a teen once who was impacted by a Bible study we were having. And uh, we read this passage in Proverbs chapter 9, verses uh, 13 through 18, that talks about a folly as an adulterous woman. And this adulterous woman, she stands at her door and she calls out to everyone and calls them to come in, but uh, they all go down to death. They fall into their folly. And when the student had read this, he recognized his sin because he could relate to this. He connected with this. He knew there was a door he could walk by, that there was this girl's house in his neighborhood, that if if he walked by it, he knew that this girl would let him in and he would fall into a sinful relationship with her. This is a timely verse that he needed to hear, and he heard that day. What's the verse you need to hear today? If you haven't found it, I am encouraging you. The word is living and active, but it only transforms you if you don't give up listening to it, if you don't give up the Scriptures. Another aspect that we should never give up in our life is sound doctrine. We should never be giving up sound doctrine. The, the passage... Uh, uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16 that we read last week, which says all Scripture is God-breathed, is useful, correcting, rebuking, and teaching. That aspect, when we know that sound doctrine gives us life, that sound doctrine we need to recognize gives sound, uh, timely discernment. We can't contradict Christ and His Word and expect to give ourselves to others in His name. In fact, what Christ says to those who are not soundly given over to him, he says in Matthew seven twenty one through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father, his will. If you want timely discernment, it better match up with who Jesus says he is. He was not just a man. He was not just a good teacher. He was not just a spirit. He is God incarnate. God with us. Fully God, fully man. He is the perfect sacrifice who was substituted on the cross for your sin. See, the cross that's hanging up there on the back reminds us that He took your place on the cross. Your place. We need to give ourselves over to the sound teaching and sound doctrine because it will give us timely discernment to know what is true. Lastly, we need to also make sure we do not give up the virtuous life. Galatians 6 talks about the fruit of the Spirit. We are also not to give up this virtuous life that has been enabled by the Holy Spirit. You see, so many Christians are content with a relationship with God that they're not willing to receive the timely conviction of the Holy Spirit who brings virtue to our being. We should never give up the virtuous life for complacency, for complacency with sinful living. Sin in us means Christ can't reign in us. And that leads to our second point this morning that we're getting into, which is that the Holy Spirit is a timely gift. But before that, I I just have a question for you. Maybe you've given up some of these things. Maybe in your life you've given up sound doctrine, you've given up scriptures, or maybe you've never turned to Christ and recognized that you were supposed to be on that cross. And so I'd just like us to pray for a second here. If you close your eyes and bow your heads, I just want us to pray. And Lord, in this moment, could we just confess to you our sin? We confess to you, Lord, there's times I've given up what is true. I've given up the wrong things of scriptures, of peace, of gathering with the body. Lord, I confess to you, I admit my sin. I acknowledge it, the responsibility I have in my sin. And Lord Jesus, today, I need your forgiveness. 
I need your forgiveness because without your forgiveness, I can't enter into your kingdom. I can't live in the promises you have for your followers. Lord, today I want to become alive in you. Lord Jesus, would you help us to become alive in Christ by turning ourselves, by giving ourselves over to sound doctrine, by giving ourselves over to the Scriptures, giving ourselves over to you. Lord, today I I just, I give myself to you. Anyone here who needs to give themselves over to you, or online, or wherever, Lord, I pray that you would help us to give ourselves over to you that you may reign, that we, you, we may become alive in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. If today you've made a decision to follow Christ, and I encourage you to talk to someone about it. I encourage you to find someone, to talk to them about it. Even if you're an introvert, you can text or email. You don't have to hide. But share with the body, because it is what leads so well into the second point, that we receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a timely gift. When you receive the Holy Spirit, He, because He is a person, was not meant to be a background idea of our faith for us to consider, but is the chosen agent of God's power given to you for transforming your soul and others. You see, the different seasons in life are always grounded by two things that the Holy Spirit gives us. In the different seasons, one of the first things the Holy Spirit gives us is holy being. The removal of sin. Being, as in B-E-I-N-G. Holy being. You can't have an inward being that is actively against God's commands and expect that you will be empowered to do good works for God in the time that He has for you. You know, an example in Scripture of that is in the Ten Commandments. God gave Israel the Ten Commandments that were to guide them, to guide them as a nation, to steer clear of sexual sin, of relational sin, idolatrous sin, all these different forms of sin. The Holy Spirit has given us because righteousness was given to us by Christ. It was imparted to us in our salvation. And it's also righteous conviction that eliminates sin from our being by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that convicts us. We're freed today if we confessed Jesus as Lord and believe God raised Him from the dead. Your life has gone from death to life because your being has changed. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't fully understand it. But by faith, you have been transformed by Christ's indwelling Spirit who removes our darkest sin. But this leads us into holy doing. This is the second aspect of this. The good works of God. Micah 6 eight says we are to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Enacting good for others is often fighting against injustice in our world, showing the loving mercy of God, and walking through life in humble obedience to God's commands. You see, the Scriptures remind us that it's not this transference of knowledge, but it's the active divine will, divine command of God that is breaking apart our hearts so that the Holy Spirit can indwell in our hearts and others. It's why the word is preached, because the Holy Spirit is speaking words of new life to everyone today, every day, every hour. In countless churches and around the world, uh, it was mentioned, you know, about the Asbury uh, revivals that are happening at Asbury University. And I've been watching this week as as countless students are coming in or, or people are coming in from all directions to this campus in Wilmore, Kentucky. And uh, it's just amazing to see how God is moving in these people's lives. There's salvation happening. There's, there's confession happening. There's repentance happening. The Holy Spirit is working in that. The Holy Spirit is guiding them. No matter what season we are in today, no matter if it's a season of peace or of war, of uprooting or planning, of sowing or reaping, we know the Spirit is a timely gift that gives us direction in whatever we do, in whatever place we are. But there's something else we need to recognize to be a giver, which leads to our third point. It's this aspect of without love, our gift is meaningless. 1 Corinthians 13.1 says, if we do not love, it's like a resounding gong. If we speak in the tongues of angels, if we have the greatest gifts in the world, if it's not with his holy love that is pouring out of us, <laughs> it's meaningless. It's meaningless like Ecclesiastes is saying. 
Holy being, holy doing results from a holy love. Faith expressing itself through love is what Galatians 5, 6 says. Without love, it's just unintelligible noise reverberating throughout the walls. If you notice, the, the sound is, is changing around here. It's getting a little clearer. It'll keep getting clearer in the, in the coming weeks here as we get new speakers. But if you understand something, love is the clarifying agent of our actions. Love is the clarifying agent of our actions. If we do good deeds without love, then our gifts are just misheard notes on the keyboard or misguided harmonies in the praise and the chorus of life. Love is what centers the Christian's entire holy doing. It results from us turning to him. It really, without love, it does become meaningless. Without this holy love, it's it's. If it's not a part of the equation of our giving, then we're missing out on what God is doing. His holy love that is reigning in and out of us. It's love at the center of our timely giving. Perhaps today someone has given you a person to care for, but you're just doing it out of obligation. Maybe you need to get down on, to the inner depths of your heart on this one and, because we need to recognize if love is not at the center of it, then it's, it's meaningless noise that's trying to match with the harmony of the kingdom. Getting in the timely tune of love is what we're called to in our giving. Because it leads to our last point this morning, that the gifts we share have a time limit. The different seasons mean the ending season is always approaching. The gifts you have to give others, we have to have an urgency behind them. You know, the reality is we're never promised tomorrow. We're never promised it. You know, in my life, I recognize that every day could be the last. Because of that, every day I live with a deep urgency for the gospel, a deep urgency to do good. I can't sit around apathetically waiting for an opportunity to be the light of Christ. I'm always, asking, always actively asking God to use me for his kingdom today. Our lives are not meaningless. So we should not give up and live hedonistic lives that just serve ourselves until we die. That is not what we can take from Ecclesiastes. In fact, meaning is given by the Lord. The Lord of lords to live out blessing to others. King Solomon in the whole passage was advocating a deep fear for the Lord in his commands because the rest all fades. Everything else around us fades. Most of us, you know, will be remembered for a couple generations by our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, But the gifts you use today for God's kingdom are eternal. They have eternal purpose. They never fade. They are never forgotten, and they're never meaningless in any season. Yet complacency, apathy, ignorance, and wrong priorities can shorten the time limit we are given by God. It can shorten it. It's why I was glad I got right with God when I was younger. I accepted the call of God to be a minister at 14, that I'm here today in this position because God urged me through the gospel to give myself over fully to it. Have you recognized the time limit that you have to give yourself to God and to others? It can't wait 10 years from now. It can't wait a year from now or a month from now. God has good gifts. He is ready to use in you and through you. But you must recognize that time is marching on. Imagine for a second that your life is like a giant hourglass that you're standing in the middle of. And each grain of sand is a moment to be giving yourself to something, given possibly to Christ's purpose. But as the grains wash over your small hands, you try to grab every single one. Your hands, you know, they they flail around the falling sand trying to grab these moments every, every year, every month, every day, every hour, every minute, every second. You're trying to grab these moments and you see these instruments behind you in the hourglass to catch the sand. You see these vessels, each a cup or bowl that has a specified purpose written on it. You see glasses with the name of your children, your neighbors, your coworkers, your church, your schools, your local businesses, your clubs, your hobbies, and so on and so on. You see all these vessels and the sand keeps slipping by so you grab one of them, whatever one you can grab quick. You grab that. The sands that keep slipping by 
So you grab the first cup of work and hobbies. And these cups, they fill up quickly, but the sand keeps running over, and you don't know what to do with the time. To do with the sands. And you see your children and your family cups, they sit empty. And you see them and you grab them so you have four cups in your hand. And you're trying to fill these cups all up and giving all your time to them. And you realize you see the other cups there neglected. You see the church. You see the scriptures. You see all these things neglected. And eventually you're, you're trying to hold so many cups, one of them falls and breaks, falls apart. And the sands keep slipping by. And then imagine the still small voice of God comes over you and says, why do you give yourself to the wrong cup? And he shows you a cup that says the knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ. And it's a big cup, a large jar, that when you go over to it, you grab it and you lift it and it's lighter than air. As Jesus says, my yoke is light, my burden is easy. As you take it over to the sands and it fills, it multiplies. And those sands can fill the other cups nearby and you see the way that Christ works in your life, the love of Christ that can be poured into your family and your friends, into your work, into your church, and so on it goes. The time becomes redeemed by the love of Christ filling you and pouring out. But when the sand stops, if this cup of Christ sits empty, it won't matter what cup you filled if the cup of Christ in your life sits empty, we need that full cup of life, of love of Christ to carry with us because it's not meaningless. Christ's love, it transforms us. You see, you can't give your love to all, but you can give your, all your love to one. Let me say that again. You can't give your love to all, so give all your love to to one. It will never be meaningless to give your time to knowing the love of Christ and then giving the love of Christ to others. When you give your time to the Lord of Lords, the great I am, the Alpha and the Omega, to the spotless Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, then you give God the most precious gift you can ever give, your heart. You give Him your heart. Today, maybe you feel like your life is, is rather meaningless or empty. You're giving up the wrong things and haven't been able to make timely discernment. Perhaps you needed to get right with God today. Perhaps you needed that again and again. But let's remember that Christ has given us a timely gift of his Holy Spirit. He's done that for us so that we may experience a holy being, holy doing, and holy love. Being a giver recognizes the slipping sands are just opportunities, just moments to give all that we have to Christ. And then through that, we give it to everyone else. Because we can't give to everyone, but we can give all to one, to the one, the King of Kings. He is worthy of it. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you for your goodness and faithfulness to us. We thank you that today we can come to you for opportunity to take the cup and the bread to recognize you as Lord over our life that is through your body that was broken through your blood that was poured out for us for our sake would you help us to see that you have filled our cup or Lord maybe if we're not filling being filled by you Lord would you help us to do that today and we'll be able to say it. That you are the Lord over our life. And all that we do, we give our heart to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers.
just remind you that the Wesleyan Church practices open communion. That means if you are in right relationship with God and with one another, you can participate in communion with us. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and giving thanks, he broke it. He told the disciples, this is my body, which was broken for you. He said, to take and eat this in remembrance of him. Would you take and eat today in remembrance of him? Father, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. It was broken so that we could experience a healed body, a whole body, a holy being. Lord, would you bless us today through your bread, through the body. In Jesus' name, amen. Usually we have some music quietly playing in the background here, but I thought, as we remember that when Jesus took the cup, he remembered that this was the sign of the new covenant to them. And he said, this cup represents my blood, the blood of the new covenant. And I was thinking about you know, the fact that we have no music right now, but I was thinking about the song, The Old Rugged Cross. I was wondering if you'd be willing to sing it with me, just, just the chorus. So I'll cling to the old rugged cross Till at last I leave my... Nope. Sorry. This is why I don't sing... Yeah, I was... 
Someone who remembers the lyrics better want to do it? Reach the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown I got them mixed up, that's why. The crown is the good deeds that you lay before the king in exchange for a cup that he was given to you. Would you take and would you drink with thanksgiving this morning? Father, we thank you for your blood that was poured out for us, for the cross of Calvary that you shed your blood on for our sake so that we could have a cup of forgiveness while you took the bitter cup and you exchanged your crown of glory for a crown of thorns and you gave us a crown to lay down before your feet someday. And Lord, we thank you that it's by your blood that we are saved. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand today? Would you go in the peace of Christ, knowing that He goes before you. That no matter the time that you have, He has made you into a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.7 says that you are a new creation. Made new. And today would you be made new and give yourself over to that. that. With all your time, with all your life, with all the energy and resources that you have, would you give yourself over to that. To Him the King of Kings. God bless you. You are dismissed.